now finally, after every night talking about this, I'm going to put our beast back up here. And uh, to you Catholic friends of mine, you understand I'm speaking of the system, not of the precious people that love Jesus and are part. Every reformer without exception believed and understood that this creature actually represents the church, the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, it has that mark. And I haven't told you what the mark is. I've told you that the number of the mark is 666. We're going to look at that, of course, the next night or two. Now, in chapter 17 of Revelation, and we will also look at this, is a, an impure woman riding a dragon that has seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. That dragon is described in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. And it says clearly that that dragon is the old serpent called the devil and Satan. Those are the exact words. And uh, the woman riding him is a whore, if you will. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. And she, I know this is hard, friends, but remember, it's not about the precious people. It's about, you, you might be surprised, folks. I believe there's going to be people saved from every Christian church on the face of the earth. Precious people. Those 60 pastor friends of mine, very few of them are going to have the nerve to tell their congregations, I'm changing what I've taught you. I pray every day, pray every, pray every day for those men, folks. I just pray that I'll see every one of them in the kingdom. Um, I told you uh, a little bit of the story, but I'm going to tell you the rest. They didn't want an Adventist, a Seventh-day Adventist, to be a member of their organization because they thought that I thought I earned my way to heaven by obedience. They believed that. Uh, I explained to them that that was not the case, and God gave me grace, and those men became my friends. And uh, the man that criticized me the most in the meeting was... Uh, not a very old man, but he was in terrible health, and he was on his deathbed in the hospital. I went to visit him. We prayed together and had a precious time of speaking about Jesus before he died. He, he was the vice president of this organization. So they, uh, is my phone ringing or is that yours? It reminds me. <laughs> I was sitting here singing and it rang, and I didn't put, slide this little button that makes it silent. Uh, a dear friend of mine from many, many years ago, oh, I wanted to walk out and talk to him, but I'll call him after the meeting. The, uh, so they had to elect a new vice president. And I have no idea, even, by t even today, how in the world my name ever got on there as a, uh, what do you call it, a nominee. And somebody in that group said, we can't have an Adventist be the vice president of this association. And a dear Baptist friend, I love this man. I loved him before he did this. A Baptist pastor stood up and said, well, if we can't have an Adventist, we can't have me either. And that's something, folks. A lot of precious folks out there, friends, love Jesus. They don't know the truth that it would be best if they knew. Because the enemy will use any error that's in your thinking, friends. He will use that to try to divert you from his plan. Are you all with me on this? You didn't say amen very strongly, but I... Please understand that. Jesus said, the truth will make you free. What he means is free in Jesus. And the enemy will use any theological error he can to slowly perhaps sidetrack 
So this is why some people say, well, wouldn't it, why would it matter if I just thought that? It's dangerous, friend. I need to listen. Do you think I have a full understanding of truth? Please say no. So every day, you and I need to be growing in our grasp of truth. And when we're willing to do that, listen, some of you, I know, are being convicted by the Spirit to make some very serious changes in your life, theologically, spiritually. It's not easy. But I just urge you to let the Lord lead you and say, okay, Lord, this is my prayer, folks, every morning. I want to do what you want me to do, Lord. Show me. And then he will help you. The way you have victory over sin, you know this. I know this. When I'm tempted to do something I know is wrong, which is different than doing something accidentally wrong, is that thing still a problem? Does it still need to be confessed to the Lord? The bad stuff is, and I know you've never, well, I shouldn't be cute, when I'm tempted to do something I know is wrong, those are tough, aren't they? But if I will say to the Lord, help me, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do, he will even change the way, he will even take the desire away for that thing, friends. It's a beautiful plan. And give me the strength to turn away from it. But you know what I found out? Ten seconds later, the desire is back. Do you know about that? What's my work? Same thing. Gentlemen, understand this. Most of you women don't like men do. I am, when I see a provocatively dressed woman, I want to look. Do you men understand what I'm saying? Say yes. What's my job? I'll tell you what I have learned to do. I, I turn away. I just simply turn away. And uh, I have found, folks, if I will say, Lord, I don't want this, he takes the desire away. But the desire can come back, folks, in a few seconds. And that's okay. What my work then is the same thing. Am I all with me on this? This is the path to victory. And don't look to me as a great example. I'm, what I'm telling you, folks, that happens with me. I, th I'm not just telling you a story I read, but uh, we all have probably a long ways to go by God's grace. I love his mercy, don't you? All right, questions this evening, and then we will carry on. Uh, how important is meditation? That's a loaded question because there are lots of meditation techniques even among Christian people that tell you you should empty your mind. You should never empty your mind. Christ should always be there, friends. This Eastern idea of emptying your mind is, is not only, uh, well, it's just dangerous. My meditation needs to be on these words. Jesus said they were words of life. We sang that. Uh, never empty my mind. You know, when I go to bed, almost every night, I start repeating in my mind passages that I've memorized. It's seldom ever the case that I get a whole chapter before <laughs> I wake up the next morning. I can remember where I quit. It's really strange. I often, the next night, will start where I left off the night before. Sometimes I get two or three verses, and I'm gone. But in any case, that's the place to have our meditations, and they are important. I said it before. It, it needs to be, folks, an awareness that is in my mind no matter what I'm doing. I'm repeating myself. And the only way that comes, folks, is through the Word, uh, reading the Word. Uh, there's counsel I've seen from spiritual leaders who tell people, you watch television and you read novels and you will just about destroy your ability to meditate on God's Word. Some of you may not want to hear that, folks, but that's really good counsel. Uh, I love to watch TV, but most of it is bad news, folks. We don't have one in our home. I was raised in a home where there was no television. 
How many of you would like to throw away your television? Not too many hands. Give it some thought. The problem is it's on your phone and your computer today, isn't it? But, all right. Um, are we to pray when we awake and just before retiring? You know what 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says? Pray without ceasing. Now, I can do that. I've learned to do that, folks. I can be talking to somebody and, and listening carefully and talking in depth. And in my mind, I'm, I'm talking to God. In fact, I learned a long time ago to pray while I'm preaching. I know, folks, that it is not in the human being's capability to inspire people. That comes from the Holy Spirit, friends. It does not come. God gives us maybe a gift to speak well or something. There was a, there was a, a Christian bookseller one time who stuttered. And he would go to the door, and I won't even try to mimic him, but he could, he could hardly get two or three words out. And at the end of the day, he would kneel in his motel room, and he would put out all of these place, people that he had made contacts with. And he became the most successful salesman of anybody, even though he could hardly speak. God blessed his effort. So be of good courage. Pray without ceasing. Try to have, it doesn't mean you're constantly saying words. You understand that? It means it's, a, it's sort of an attitude of the soul, if you will. That, uh, and it's not easy to just make that happen all the time. But every time you're reminded, you start talking to God again. He will amplify that for you. How does a person let God's will be done? You know, in, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, uh, on earth as well as, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some, probably, whoever wrote that was probably thinking along that line. Well, that's a, a good question, and it has a great possible uh, need of treatment. But uh, part of that is that by God's grace, I can do his will. By God's grace, I may be able to encourage other people to do his will. And I might even uh, spend some of my money helping God's will get done <laughs> and so forth. The point is, the Lord will give you ideas. Uh, in fact, my prayer every morning, yours probably is too, Lord, how can I do your work today while I do my regular work that I have to do or should do? So God certainly wants you and me to be people who effect, and of course, it's by his power that his will is done. Wouldn't it be church even if only two were gathered together and God is the subject? I think this has to do with the idea that Actually, we're counseled in the Bible, friends. This is uh, Hebrews 10, is it verse 17? Is it, is it even on here? Uh, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? His second coming. It's a wonderful thing, folks, to be able to gather with believers and sing together and study the word together and listen, God ordained that people speak for him. This preaching is not just something that somebody invented. It's a, it's a very special... I, I, I spend a lot of time just listening to preachers preach. I love it. Uh, many, most of them are way more able than I am. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, you know, any of you can become an exponent for God. So... It's okay if you only have two people, but when the group is larger, uh, it's just a wonderful blessing. I sang in a choir one time of several thousand high school kids. I can't wait to get to heaven. Uh, how many of you can't sing very well? Go ahead and raise your hands. Let me see your hands. Boy, there's a lot of you. <laughs> in heaven, folks. You're going to sing like an angel. You know, I've sung in a lot of male quartets. I would rather eat, I would rather sing in a male quartet than eat food. I kid you not. That is, to, to hear these other harmonies and to be part of it, and you can't hear any one voice. You just hear this beautiful chord. Oh, and when you're, when you're doing that, you part. One night in a swimming pool. Why am I telling you these stories? <laughs> My wife and I used to hold, we still do this, in fact, 
two days after we get back from this trip, we go to another town across the state to do health lectures, and I'll be preaching in the church there. Anyway, there was this very wealthy millionaire who had a hot springs up in the mountains of central Oregon. Cost you thousands of dollars to go up there and rent a cottage for a couple of nights. But he loved the work we were doing, and there was a physician friend uh, as well, both of us, and this man would give us this whole property for a whole week to do what we used to call a live-in. The proper term is a residential uh, seminar to teach people how to get well. And we were out in the hot, in a big swimming, swimming pool as big as this room, hot water. And, and there were four of us men just talking, the, uh, the, the, the physician who was the director of this men's chorus and my physician friend and I that were doing the lecturing and some other fellow. And we just found out that the four of us had all four parts, and we started singing out there in the middle of that pool. Oh, it was powerful. And uh, uh, this guy, who was the, this physician, who himself had diabetes, and he was there to get well, uh, he said to me, you ought to join our men's chorus. And I said, well, actually, I sang in it recently. One of your, one of your members <laughs> invited me to come and sing. But that was a group of 120 men, folks. Uh, oh, the, I, I, I'd, I'd skip a meal any day to sing with that group. And when we get to heaven, folks, everybody's going to have a fabulous ability to sing. And won't it be fun to have choir? I can imagine antiphonal choirs. Do you know what antiphonal means? This choir sings, and this choir sings the same thing right afterwards. If you, you know what I'm talking about? And I can imagine, uh, of course, I like to fly airplanes too, so I think of this. I can imagine instead of standing around, they'd be flying. You can fly in heaven, can't you? And uh, I, can, I can just picture a million people singing, beautiful, and another million people come flying by and sing the same thing. Won't that be fun? All right. None of that was in the notes. I got to get busy here. <clears throat> ah, what does it mean to not be under the law but under grace? I'll tell you, and then I'll give you an example. It means that when you are forgiven, you are not being condemned because you have been forgiven. You all with me on that? Here's the story. <clears throat> when our girls were in grade school, I was pastoring in Billings, Montana, and every day at, when school was out, usually Neva had a meal ready, and she would pick the girls up, and I would arrange my schedule so I would be home about the same time, and we would have lunch together. And... Uh, that particular day, I was home, sitting at my desk downstairs in my jeans and T-shirt. And uh, suddenly, it was time, and Neba had, was, had, had, had gotten behind. And I said, oh, I'll go get the kids. Uh, so I jumped in the car and took off down our country road, uh, forgetting the speed limit. And uh, came around the corner, and there was a city cop that uh, was parked there. And I just, before I ever even passed him up, I just pulled over and parked on the other side of the street. And uh, he rolled his window down, and he went like this. So I got out and got in the car and sat by him, and he's filling out this citation about that size, not quite so tall and a little longer. You all know about that, don't you? <laughs> and so he has the whole thing filled out, and he turns and looks at me, and he says, don't I know you? I was one of the police chaplains. And I was too embarrassed. Here I am in my jeans. I don't even have my wallet with me. I said, yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed. Uh, I'm one of the chaplains. Oh, yeah, he said, sure. And he took his pen. And watch what he wrote on this. Void. And he... And he uh, tore off the top cover and gave it to me. And he said, take it easy, Pastor. <laughs> now listen, now that I've been taken out from under the law, I'm free to drive as fast as I want, right? No. In fact, if I'm an upright person, friends, I will be even more careful to follow the law. Amen? Amen. That's what it means to be under grace and not the law. 
when I'm forgiven, it raises up in my heart the desire to honor my Savior and be more upright than I have been and to avoid that mistake. Listen, folks, if I will think about what happened in that situation where I made the mistake, it can help me avoid it in the future. With God's help, uh, praise his name. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. This is a very good example of even a dear pastor who will take one text and let that determine his theology about what happens when you die. Could Paul have meant that uh, he was teaching that when you die, you go to heaven? Could Paul have meant that? I mean, is it conceivable that had he meant that, he could have said it like that? The answer is yes. The context doesn't support that. But that is the main scripture that most Protestant organizations used to say that when you die, if you're saved, you go to heaven. If you take, which we're going to do now, I won't take everything, but I'm going to give you a good outline of all the scriptures that relate to that. It will be so obvious to you folks that in the grave there is no consciousness. Are you all with me on this? And uh, some people might not be pleased about that because you have pictured your father or your friend in the heaven. And, uh, but the Bible does not teach that, folks. So what happens really when we die? Is there a conscious existence after death? Boy, there's a lot of stuff out there. I'm not going to take time to even hardly talk about it, but all kinds of books and programs and haunted houses and all kinds of things uh, talking about uh, what happens after you die and how you go somewhere. And, and like I say, somebody say, why does it matter? Because truth always matters. The Bible clearly explains the truth of this subject and reveals its prophetic implications. Near-death experiences, you all know about this. There's a very famous theologian, and I appreciate very much what he has done in compiling evidence that Jesus was, that there was a resurrection of a human named Jesus Christ from Nazareth. You all with me? And uh, I'll say his name. It'll come to my mind maybe in a second here. But I was very sorry to hear him because he's kind of Habermath, uh, Habermath, something like that. He has become sort of the guru of collecting evidence, historical evidence. Any qualified ancient history professor will tell you certainly Jesus Christ existed. There's no question about that. And if you're interested and you want to write this down, by the way, don't forget to put your questions on your card tonight. And please put your name on there if you would. And if God is convicting you about being baptized, and I hope he is if you haven't, Please put the word baptism on there and circle it so I'll notice it. Any case, uh, Habermath, oh, any, any ancient history PhD in, with ancient history, well, absolutely, there's no question. There's plenty of historical evidence that Jesus Christ existed. And the evidence is building that he was physically resurrected. Now, what I was going to else have you put on your card, but you're going to turn it in, so you need to put it somewhere else. <laughs> is the name of a scientist by the name of James, or Jim, you can think of that, tour, like a tour bus. Got that? Easy to remember. James, or Jim, tour. On YouTube, uh, he, is, he is the world's most famous synthetic organic chemist. Everybody knows he's going to get the Nobel Prize for the unbelievable work that this man has done. Now, he's Jewish. And don't misunderstand this. It's not fair. Jewish people are smart. Have you ever noticed that? And I'll tell you why, folks. They are the children of Abraham. God bless those people. And, and I'm not one of them, and I, I struggle to learn stuff. Uh, but I can understand most, a lot of, most of what he says because I used to be a chemistry teacher too. But nevertheless, he became a believer. It's a fabulous story. Get on YouTube and just listen to his story. And this man loves Jesus. And for Jews, folks, his relatives say, what's wrong with you? You're a Jew. 
It's exactly what they told him. But he loves Jesus. It just beams all over his face. And he, because of his prowess, every, listen, every time he gets on an airplane going anywhere, they recognize him and put him in first class. And uh, several times, some other scientist is uh, up there too because they're famous. And he's told stories about how they visit together on these trips. But uh, because he is so highly respected, he can get any scientist. Any of them are delighted to come and be on his program. And the first question he asks is, you're a scientist. You have PhDs, more than one. How could you believe in something so ridiculous? This is tongue in cheek, right? So ridiculous as resurrection from the dead. And then this famous scientist, who you know, he, he has believers. You understand what I'm talking about, right? Well, we'll explain why. And one of the biggest reasons is 12 men wouldn't have gone out and sacrificed their lives for the cause if they didn't believe Jesus had been raised from the dead. Are you all with me on that? That's incredible evidence. And even the historians who are non-believers will tell you, yes, there's evidence that those men did that. Pretty powerful, wouldn't you say? Amazing. Anyway, spend some time listening to Jim. Now, when he's interviewing these scientists, it gets pretty highfalutin language, and you might have to say, well, I'll turn that off. But it's a wonderful thing, folks. What God is doing today in the secular world. So Habermath, unfortunately, compiled hundreds of stories of near-death experiences. And he, I'm sorry to say, uses that as additional support for the fact that uh, uh, you know, God is saving people. Of course, Habermath doesn't believe uh, what I'm teaching here this evening, that when you die, I don't know if you want to call it unconscious. That's not the same kind of unconscious when you and I uh, happen to get into a, some kind of a, a wreck or something where we're unconscious for a while. Uh, you know what the Bible, the Bible uh, uses often to describe somebody who is dead? Yeah, and I'll read that to you in just a minute. Jesus uh, used that metaphor. And it's like this. When you die and you wake up a thousand years later, it will have seemed like that. Anybody that's had surgery with anesthesia knows what I'm talking about, right? It's amazing. You can wake up hours and hours later, and it seems like it was just a moment. And that's what it will be like. We'll see some scriptures that teach that. So... Uh, I'll just tell you what I think about the life after death experience or near death experiences. By the way, you ever hear somebody? Maybe you've done this, and please don't please don't misunderstand this. Uh, somebody says I died seven times. What they mean is, or three times, or whatever, their heart quit beating, and then the uh, clinicians uh, shocked it, and it started beating again, and maybe maybe they got the person to stay alive for a long time. Uh, that person didn't die. Just because your heart stops doesn't mean you're dead. Clinically dead is when there are no brain waves. And uh, I'm trying to decide whether to tell you a story or not. <laughs> um, I used to fly an ambulance airplane. Uh, that's another thing I'd rather do than eat, is fly airplanes. I said that. And I was coming back uh, with a patient from way out at the end of the state of Montana one morning about 2 o'clock, and um, of course dark. And on the radio, I hear uh, another ambulance. This was a helicopter hitting somebody. I, I, I only heard bits and pieces of it. I was quite a long ways off. And it turned out uh, that it was uh, the son of one of my parishioners was coming home at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you might know what that means. And his car went off his truck. They were farmers, went off the gravel road. And he had a tremendous blow to the head. And uh, I was home at 6 o'clock in the morning when my head deacon called me, and he said, have you heard about so-and-so's son? And I said, no. And so I raced to the airport. The family was there. They were all giving blood. People were lined up early in the morning around the block because of 
note had gone out on the radio. This, the neurosurgeon was trying to stanch, uh, staunch the flow of blood from uh, this blow to the head. And he kept digging away at brain tissue, horrible thing to have to do, but you try, you think, maybe I can stop the blood. And after 22 pints or something or other, he finally got there and uh, clipped off, su not, didn't suture, he probably uh, cauterized it. And, but he told the family, this, this boy is uh, going to be a vegetable. And I was with the family, uh, I think it was four days later, three days later, after they kept testing one day after the other for brain waves. And there were none. Now, that boy was kept alive, that young man was kept alive by a ventilator. As long as you supply oxygen to the muscles in the body, um, the heart will beat. The muscles could be used if the brain was there to tell them to be used. The heart has its own electrical system. It doesn't need the brain to tell it to beat. Normally, the brain is involved with that, but it can, it can do it by itself. So he was dead. He was dead. And uh, I was with the family when uh, his sister, who was a nurse, wanted to go in with the doctor, we could see him in the room, and he turned the little dial. And uh, the ventilator stopped, and within about a minute and a half, the heart stopped. My understanding, I'm proposing to you, it's a little bit difficult to prove this, but I think it's quite clear, that when people are, as they expire, their brain does things, maybe something like a dream. And uh, they, for whatever reason, some people have this s sense that uh, they're watching themselves die. It is not biblical to say that they did that because they're on their way to heaven and were just watching for a minute before they left. The Bible does not support that. The Bible speaks against that. But I think it's, it's possible clinically to understand why that happens. I don't think you should tell people there's no such thing as people having that experience. But uh, it certainly is no, nothing even close to saying, oh, that means that they're on their way to heaven. All right. 70 million Americans said they think it's possible to communicate with the dead. Now, this is another step. All right, if people who die are in heaven, then maybe they could talk to us. And that has some real serious implications, friends. Because, again, it's because it's not true according to the Bible. And in chapter 13, where I mention uh, the picture turned over now, that creature uh, that represents the devil, that dragon, uh, it says that his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. You read it there in Revelation 13. It speaks of it, it speaks of it more than once. And it's clear from other places in the book of Revelation that the, the, that the star stands for uh, an angel. So about a third of the angels uh, that used to be God's angels followed Lucifer, who became the devil. I think most of you know that. That's what the Bible teaches. They followed Lucifer. And these angels are roaming the earth, creating as much mayhem as they can. They hate Jesus. They hate God. They want to destroy as many people as they have because they have memorized the Bible. They know what their end is going to be. And they have this twisted mind, thanks to Lucifer, that uh, the more people they take with them, the more they can hurt Jesus. And it does hurt Jesus. Folks, you know this. He loves every person that ever lived on this earth more than you and I can understand. And it's a pain to him, of course. So this is nothing to be trivial with, folks. And you may, there are stories, folks, where you, people start fooling with this, and, and the, it sort of gives the devil pleasure, uh, priv the uh, that's not the word I want. A permission is part, partly it, uh, to torment that person. And you never want to be there, folks. And if somebody has ever been there or, or dabbling with that, you, you, God can get you out of it. But it can be a tough road. Well, 
can we communicate with the dead? Uh, can the living know? Uh, Spiritism claims that we're not dead when we die, that there is a spirit, and we'll read this in just a moment. This is what they teach. The fundamental principle is that the human beings survive bodily death. And uh, occasionally, under conditions not yet fully understood, this is their words, they can, you can communicate with those people who have, as we say, have gone before. Uh, this is what they claim. There is no death in the graveyard. And a man named Oliver Lodge says, I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that people live after death, for I frequently talk with them. Most of you know this, but in case you didn't know this, uh, you can see this in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Be not forgetful to entertain, entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Angels have the ability to make themselves look like any, this is kind of crazy, folks, but this is what the Bible teaches. They can, they can personate anybody, and make their voice sound the same. And because they have a lot of knowledge, after all, the angels are smart and they've been around watching everybody, they can walk into your house and look like a, 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 a relative that has died and talk like them and remember everything. And would that be very convincing to most people? And it probably will never happen to you. But there are stories of believers to whom that has happened and one lady, and I don't know this happened, I just was told that it happened by somebody that was sure it did. She lost a child. And one day that child came running back into the house and jumped into her lap and said, Mommy, Mommy, I'm not dead. Now you, you try to put yourself in that mother's place who has been grieving for who knows how many months, right? And longing to just put her arms around that child. And she had the fortitude to say, Lord, this is not my child. And the child, poof, just disappeared. The devil is nobody to play around with, friends. He is far more powerful than you and I. But Christ will protect us if we stay faithful. Ask of God who gives to all men liberally. Sanctify them. Teach them through thy truth and thy word is the truth. So what's the basic nature of the, according to the Bible? Are we mortal or immortal? You're right. I'll read you the text. <laughs> Shall mortal man become, uh, be more just than God? See, we're mortal. And notice, speaking of God, the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Notice the next verse. Uh, it says, who only hath immortality. This is speaking of God, and I would love to take more time to read the text, but you'll have those for you. So maybe it's just the body that's mortal. Maybe there's a spirit or a soul that lives. This is often claimed. Ezekiel be said, Behold, all souls are mine, speaking for God, as this, or, or writing what God spoke. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall what? Now, it's interesting, folks. People say, but I've heard it. I've heard people preach it. I've heard it in poems and songs. Um, and this comes from different places in the world. In India, you probably know this. Neve and I have worked in India. Uh, they believe that they come back in reincarnation. That's why they uh, are so careful of their cows, which they worship. But if you have an accident in India, folks, and you run into a cow, even though this seems sort of strange, you really should just get out of Dodge fast because they will take your life for having killed or damaged one of their gods. Um, in any case, uh, this comes from their religion. In China, ancestors are worshipped. In Africa, we've worked in Africa. The fear of the spirits is, is monumental among the peoples there. Egypt, the pyramids are built for their deceased kings, and you know these things. These two words are used almost a thousand times. Let's take a moment to understand what they mean. The only Hebrew word used for, or translated soul, nefesh, refers to a living, breathing, conscious body. You talk to any Hebrew scholar, I don't care what their beliefs are, they will say, yeah, that's what that means. A living, breathing, conscious, rather than to some immortal being or soul. The Hebrew word for spirit, you have, you're supposed to put a, a guttural at the end, rock, uh, means wind. 
or air. Now, the Greek is similar. The Greek word for soul is psyche. It does in no way, any Greek scholar knows this, does not refer to an immortal soul. The Greek word for spirit is, we would leave the P silent, but we, in the Greek we say pneuma. Have any of you ever driven a car with pneumatic tires? We don't use that word, do we? But you all know the word, of course, because what's in those tires? Air. They're pneumatic tires, or pneumatic, if you will. And uh, so here is the creation. And the Bible says that uh, God formed, and of course in John 1 it says Jesus did this, formed man from the dust of the ground. Um, let me give you a little lesson in biochemistry. Are you ready? I don't think this was a mud pie. I think God actually created the cells, the 70 trillion cells that make, made up his body. And each of those cells, folks, I'll use, uh, um, I'll use Jim Tour's description, is, is complicated beyond belief. Trillions and trillions of molecules in the cell, most of them formed into uh, atoms, most of them formed into protein molecules and DNA and all kinds of things. And there's this lipid bilayer that makes the, that makes the uh, shell, if you will, of the cell. And it is complex. It is unbelievable, folks. I, it's just incredible. I believe that Jesus created all of those substances. but they were not alive. Scientists today are trying to build a cell from scratch. They believe that if they could make all those parts and put them all in there in the right concentrations, they believe that the cell would be alive. That's not the case. You say, how do you know? I don't. I just believe what, what the Bible says. Uh, so Adam is laying there. He's not alive. But every cell, and every cell in his body is not alive. And uh, I've, I've, I've imagined this just for the sake of discussion. If I was standing there with him as he was getting ready to make Adam alive, because you know the Bible says that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. You know that, right? Uh, so let's say I'm there watching all this, and I say, w would you let me blow in there instead of you? And maybe he'd say, sure, go ahead. So I kneel down, and I blow some air into his lungs. Would he come alive? When we get to heaven, folks, and go to chemistry class, I'm going to class in heaven. I got a lot of questions. Don't you? I'd love to have him describe, but it's quite clear, folks, that it is the power of the presence of God with these chemicals that makes those cells live. Got that? So the Bible writers describe this as God breathing, and he may have blown air in there, but it was not the air that made Adam come to life, folks. It was the power of the living God. Are you all with me on that? It is a miracle. That is a miracle of God's presence, if you will, in every cell of your body that makes it live. The chemist will tell you that the moment the cell dies, all the chemicals are still there in the right concentrations. What happened? Well, the Bible describes this power as breath, or pneuma, the spirit of God. And it says that when you die, the spirit returns to God who gave it. It's not talking about some entity. It's talking about whatever power it is that God has in you, that when you die, it's his again. Are you all with me on that? That's the idea that is given in the scriptures. Now, it's, this, is, this is interesting. 
the man who sells this photograph and others from this artist is a friend of mine. And I said to him, look it, Jesus has clothing. Why don't you put clothing on Adam and Eve? Well, you say the Bible says they were naked. Well, that's a relative term. They didn't have cloth on them. I believe that they were clothed with a robe of light. So with your permission, from now on, we're going to do it like this. Isn't that better? The Lord God commanded, saying, of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You've probably processed this, but in case you haven't, the question is, why would God do this? And by the way, that tree was in the very middle of the garden, not off somewhere on the edge. And I'm sure that God will explain this in a much better way than I am. But God was giving even Adam and Eve the possibility of growing in their trust with him. And so there was a possibility for them to sin. Y'all with me on that? And uh, that may not be a perfect explanation, but this is what the Bible teaches, as you well know, probably every one of you. And uh, the serpent, this was Lucifer, who could make himself look like a serpent. And we don't know this from the Bible necessarily, but it does say the serpent was more subtle. I think probably the serpent was this gorgeous flying creature. By the way, snakes have little appendages on them that the uh, uh, scientists, when they study the skeleton, say there used to be some wings attached here. Uh, we don't have that today. I believe it's, they're gone because this thing was cursed. I think most of you know that story. Uh, so the serpent catches Eve. She has left Adam's side, which was not to happen. And uh, he catches her attention, this gorgeous creature. And no animals spoke. And here was this creature speaking. And so it caught uh, Eve's attention. And the woman said, we can eat anything, I'm paraphrasing, except the fruit of this tree you're in. And we're not supposed to touch it either. Now, actually, God never said that. Uh, but Eve, for some reason, said that. And she told the serpent, this is Satan himself. This is Lucifer himself in the form of a snake or a serpent, if you will. And the serpent said, ye shall not surely die. The first lie recorded in the Bible. Pretty interesting. So she takes of it, as you know. Goes to Adam, and he does too. And, and that has wreaked the havoc that, it ha that we have today. So... They're going to die. You might say, well, they didn't die that day. A lot of people struggle with that. They certainly died spiritually, friends. And the only way for you and me to have spiritual life is the infilling of Christ in us. So you might want to ask God why he used that phraseology, but I think that uh, that's really what was being said. Here's how uh, Solomon describes death. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And what does that word spirit mean? Air, which is a metaphor for the power of God that he blew into Adam, correct? And so that power uh, is, is taken back by God when we die. This does not in any way describe something conscious going to heaven. This is another illustration, folks, of how it's, it's strange to me. And I'll tell you what's actually happening. This lady represents the church. You all with me on that, right? All the reformers saw that. This, uh, this little horn represents the church, and so does this impure woman. And she's considered impure because of her doctrines. I listed some of the doctrines, folks, that are not biblical. Do you remember that? Quite a long list. And most of those doctrines came from paganism. That's why this dream of these pagan backgrounds uh, 
was given to Daniel, and where it's hidden now, this creature that has the mark, uh, is the sum of all those beasts. You remember bare feet and leopard body and lion's heads? This, uh, this woman got her teachings partly from paganism. And uh, she has a name on her forehead, Mother of Harlots. And uh, this is hard to hear, folks, but most of the Protestant churches actually came out of Catholicism. Did you know that? And uh, I love those people. Please don't misunderstand this, folks. I have some dear friends in those places. But there's deception. And uh, it, it, it came from paganism through, if you will, the mother church. That's how those things got there. Um, the spirit returns. So Jesus blew, if you will, it's a metaphor for him just giving Adam and making him live, every single cell in his body. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the, look, the breath of life. When you put that thing on your tire and it helps it get big again, that's not the breath of life, is it? That's just plain air. For as the body without the spirit is dead, this is James. He uses that to illustrate that faith without works is dead. Very interesting material. Go to the book of Job. And uh, he got this. He knew this. This is the oldest living person talked of in the Bible other than Christ himself uh, and Adam and Eve and their children. Uh, All the while my breath is in me, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Did he get it? You Are you all with me? You didn't respond. He understood that this metaphor uh, of breath represented God's power. And this is Job. If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my hard service will I wait till my change comes. Thou hidest thy face. Oh, this is David. I'm sorry. So, so Job understood this idea. This is David. Thou hidest thy face. They are, they, uh, thy face. They are troubled. Thou takest away their breath. And what happens to them? And return to their dust. You find texts all through the Bible that speak of this clarity. Thou sendest forth thy spirit. And they're what? Amazing. The Lord God formed man of the dust and breathed into him the breath of life. Let me illustrate a simple illustration. Here you have a box. And uh, it's made up of nails and boards. And uh, if you took that box and took the nails out and laid them on the ground and laid the boards on the ground, you could say, where did the box go? Are the parts still there? the box ceased to exist. A simple little illustration uh, to try to help people see that nothing went to heaven in the terms of consciousness. Uh, The Spirit of God, his power did. All right. So the Bible definition of a soul is like this. Body plus... And this is what it says in Genesis. God breathed into uh, man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And if the breath is gone, if the body is not there, there's no soul. If the breath is not there, there's no soul. Are you all with me on this, friends? The soul didn't go anywhere. It just what? Ceased to exist. But the Bible is clear that a soul is a body that has been made alive by God's breath. And when he takes that power back, there is no consciousness, just the dust. For that which befalleth us, now listen to this, for that which befalleth men befalls beasts. Even one thing, as one dieth, so dieth the other. They all have one breath. A man has no preeminence above a beast in the sense of what makes him alive. Is that a clear text if there was ever a clear text? This is why, folks, again, in a form of doctrine, read everything in the Bible about that question. 
and it will almost always be clear, uh, abundantly clear, what should be understood. All go to one place. They're all of dust. They go back to dust. Men and brethren, this is Paul. Let me speak to you freely of David. He is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us today. In other words, Paul was standing maybe somewhere, not too far from where David was in a box. Is that correct? He's not in heaven. There's no part of him that's in heaven. Of course, the power that made him live is back to God, but that's not something conscious. This is Paul. He goes on to say, David is not yet ascended into the heavens. How could you have these doctrines, folks, that the churches have developed, that somehow you're alive after you die, when they see a text like this? It's amazing. Are you all with me? And, 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 you know, somebody in this room came to me and said I went to a funeral yesterday. Maybe it was a couple of days ago. And there they put him in heaven, and they're so happy they're with God now. Listen, folks, not only is that not true, that would actually be a horrible existence. It's bad enough for you and me to know the mayhem that we do know. Everybody understands that when you're in heaven, you could know anything you want, and you see all the horrible stuff that's going on in this world. It would be miserable. It's miserable for me, folks, to watch my two daughters continue to go downhill spiritually. You all with me on this? A lot of you know what I'm talking about. Personally, I should say, you all know what I'm talking about. It's, I cry every day. I can hardly talk about my daughters without crying. I said that before. In heaven now would be misery, friends. It's a blessed thing to just go to sleep and wait for Jesus one day call you forth from the grave, right? Well then, what about the reward? Thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot, they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the what, friends? At the resurrection. The Son of Man shall come in his glory with all his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his. Isn't that amazing, friends? Such plain descriptions by Jesus himself. Uh, and people ignore it because they perhaps want to believe. This is Jesus speaking. I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. What about the wicked, the unsaved? Uh, that's what I would rather call them, the unforgiven. They are wicked, but I, I would rather just say they're unforgiven. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice. How can you have that text and say they're in heaven right now? They'll invent some idea, well, when Jesus comes, he'll bring their soul back and unite it with their body. That's what they actually teach. Uh, but, of course, this is just not what the Bible describes at all. They will, have, they will come forth, you and I, those who have been forgiven, I'm going to say, unto the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. These are the two resurrections that the Bible talks about. Um, Jesus himself in John 5, 29, in fact, this, this is the verse, isn't it, the, is the one who said this. There are these two resurrections. And uh, in, a, in a night or two, we're going to look at where those occur in history in terms of the millennium. This is Job speaking. I'm going to pass it up because I'm getting out of time and I want to do one more thing with you this evening. If a man die, will he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change come. In other words, he's going to be waiting in the grave. This is uh, in the book of Daniel. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince. That's Jesus. It's that, that word Michael represents Jesus. You can tell it from here, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was as there, since there was a nation. We're going to look at that in terms of the millennium as well. And but my people will be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life. And what? Yeah, they will, their lives will be ended, as you'll see in other places. The story of Lazarus, Jesus' friend, just four miles from Jerusalem. Um, 
the disciples in that picture that I just covered up are with Jesus on their way to Bethany. Jesus, you know, most of you know the story. Jesus got us message from the sisters, the two sisters, Mary and Martha. They're all friends of his, and that's almost always where Jesus stays when he's near Jerusalem. And Mary sends this message. He whom thou lovest is sick. I like that, don't you? <laughs> that's all of you, folks. He whom thou lovest. And um, Jesus, on purpose, listen to this, waited for him to die before he even started out, because it's only a one and a half hour walk from where they were in Jerusalem to their home in Bethany. When he got there, Mary came out and met him, and she said, if you had come here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then it's a precious story that I'm going to hurry through. Um, so Jesus tells the mourners to stop, and he asked them to roll the stone away from the grave where Lazarus had been dead for four days. And Mary said, or was it Martha? Oh, no, no, he stinks. That's what the King James uses uh, because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said, roll the, stone, roll the stone away. And then he said three words. Uh, oh, and by the way, on the way to Bethany, Jesus, you read this in John chapter 11, Jesus told the disciples uh, that Lazarus, I mean, they all knew he was, near, he was dying. And Jesus says to the disciples, Lazarus is sleeping. And the disciples say, uh, oh, if he's sleeping, he's getting better. We all say that about people who are sick, don't we usually? And uh, they, they knew that clear back then. And then, watch this. Then Jesus spake plainly. Well, I'm sorry, here it says, he, he, he was talking about his death. What did Jesus call death that day? Sleep. It's a metaphor, folks. Jesus knew that he was not taking his rest in sleep. The disciples thought that's what Jesus meant. Is that what it says? And then Jesus says to them plainly, what does he say? He's dead. But I'm calling his death a sleep because I'm going to wake him out of his sleep. And he'll do that for you and me if he doesn't come before we are laid to rest. And I have a feeling, folks, that that coming is getting very, very close. He says to the disciples, I'm glad I wasn't there. So you'll understand. You're going to believe. But let's go. Let's go see him. Um, and that's the text I already said to you. Jesus said, your brother will live again or rise again. And she said, she knew this. She says, I know he will rise in the resurrection. Isn't that something? That she knew this, she knew this doctrine probably taught by Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. If someone believes in me, though he die, he shall live. That's the word for you and me today, folks, this evening. So they removed the stone. And uh, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. A dear old pastor friend of mine who's gone now said, it's a good thing Jesus said Lazarus. Or graves would have broken up all over the place. <laughs> and they will one of these days. Is that correct? That's right. And he was all tied up, and Jesus says, loose the man. Well, uh, death is asleep. That's a metaphor. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Amazing, folks, how plain this is. Solomon, the man who was the wisest man that ever lived besides Christ. They don't have a reward right now. Their memory is gone. Whosoever, whatever the hand finds it to do, do it now. Because there's no wisdom in the grave where you're going. I'm hurrying through these texts. <clears throat> what happened to our thoughts when the breath goes forth? They stop. These texts are all over the place, friends. But somebody will come along and take a text that says, uh, absent from the body and present with the Lord. And that will be just base their doctrine that when you die, you, you're going to be in heaven the moment you die. It's, it's astonishing to me. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living shall praise thee as I do this day. The 
father to the children shall make known thy truth. This is things in Isaiah that help. Uh, the dead praise not the Lord. How can you read these things and come up with these other teachings? It's amazing. For in death there is no remembrance of these. It's on and on, folks. And of course, uh, people say, well, uh, I've heard about it. But uh, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, as I said for you. Here's the text in Hebrews. Angels can look like people if they choose to. Jesus said, I'm going to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, the last trump for the trumpet shall sound. This is, this is amazing, folks, that uh, people think there's a secret rapture. Many times in the Bible when it's talking about people being resurrected, it's a noisy event. The trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised. Incorruptible, we shall be changed. What about the thief on the cross? He couldn't be baptized. This is an amazing story. I mentioned this last night, didn't I? How one thief, or did I tell somebody else this? Uh, okay, was cursing Jesus, and the other thief finally said, but what are you doing? And he turns to Jesus, and he says, remember we when thou comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly, I say unto you, that's what verily means, you will be with me in paradise. Now, I want you to know something about this comma. The... the uh, In the Greek Bible that we're reading from right now, there isn't even spaces between words. It's all one line of capital letters. No pronunciation. No, what do, I, what do we call those marks? Punctuation is the word I was after. So, uh, but people will take this as though there's a comma. I truly, I, truly I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. But if you put the comma somewhere else, truly I say unto thee today, you will be with me in paradise. It makes all the difference, doesn't it? Whether it's inflection of the voice or whether it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the way we form the words. Now, this, these two texts, just quickly, uh, show you that this could not have been true. Because crucifixion normally did not kill people very quickly. So it tells here, these are scriptures in the Bible, how they broke this man's legs doesn't say this, but it's probably so they couldn't run away. Cruel. Just bust their legs and, and put them back on the cross the next day. So this man didn't even die that day. Isn't it amazing, folks? When people don't look at the whole stories, the whole scriptures, they can get things really uh, mixed up. And so my appeal is, let's understand uh, what the real story is by doing this. They broke their legs of the two men, Jesus was dead, so they didn't break his legs. Very interesting. See that? John 19, verse 33. All right. Um, this is the story in the garden, and I'm going to uh, stop. It's a beautiful story, but I'm going to turn this off for the moment. I'm going to do one quick thing. I apologize because we are several minutes over. But uh, I want you to start to get a picture of something that's going to turn out to be important here in the last couple of times we're together. In the book of Revelation, in fact, would you please turn your, in your Bible with me? Uh, I promise I'll do this quite quickly. Turn with your Bible with me to chapter um, 11 in the book of Revelation. I'll read it for you, but I'd like you to see it and maybe even mark it. First, I'm going to read a sentence in chapter 13. So flip another page. And um, notice in verse, this is chapter 13. Notice that it says in verse 5, this is this, uh, this is this beast that's got the mark, that's going to have the mark. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and what? And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. That's 1,260 days or years. He opened his mouth and blasphemed me against God. Watch this now. To blaspheme his name and his what? And his tabernacle. Now turn to chapter 11. And the last... 
verse, chapter, verse 19 says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. The words temple and tabernacle are interchangeable. There is a church, a tabernacle in heaven. Are you all with me on this? Uh, this beast was blaspheming the tabernacle. Is that correct? And here it says, in John's vision, he saw, suddenly he could see the temple in heaven. And notice what it says. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. This, you guys aren't like I am. I, 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 I never saw this film. I think it was so long ago. I don't know how old I was. Uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You remember that? And if you look on YouTube, there's, I did the other day. I had no idea. There's got to be 50 films in there about this golden chest that was in the Israelite temple. In the wilderness, they built it. You know what I mean by wilderness when they're traveling from Exodus to, to uh, from in the Exodus when traveling, traveling from Egypt to Canaan. This fabulously gold uh, chest with a solid gold lid and two solid gold angels standing there on it. Uh, and before uh, Nebuchadnezzar got to, Bab got to Jerusalem and destroyed it, a couple of people, several people had the sense to take that thing and hide it, and it's never been found. But the, but the tent, it was a traveling church or a traveling tabernacle. In Exodus 25, voice, 25 verse 8, it's God saying, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so the Israelites built this thing. Later on, it was Solomon's temple. You all know about that, right? This unbelievably uh, rich with gold, uh, big building. But in the, in the, uh, in the wilderness, uh, those 40 years, it was, it was a tent made of wood, uh, some walls with, covered with gold. And, and, and uh, this is what, what, did you see where I laid the pen just now? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, they built this. In fact, the, the word skene in Hebrew means tent of meeting, meaning, uh, meeting. So all the way through the Old Testament, wherever it talks about the sanctuary, uh, that, that Hebrew word means tent of meeting. And God said, let them make this thing for me that I may dwell among them. The reason I'm taking the time to do this for just several minutes here is it's going to be critical for us to understand a couple of things before we're done this week. But in the tent that the Israelites made, and it's very similar to what was in, in heaven, there was the God's throne represented by this chest. I don't know if you know this. You probably do. These two angels standing on it represent that this, this is where God sits in heaven. He sits in the church on this throne, and there are real angels standing there, uh, it's a strange thing for you and me because we're not used to royalty, royalty are we? But uh, that's the way it's pictured. And uh, on the earth, because God actually did come and dwell right there, they put a curtain here because if anybody ever saw God, they would die. And the priest would come in here. There was an altar right here where he would put incense. There's a formula in the Bible for the incense and, you know, you and I know about incense. People buy a stick of it and light it and let it smell the room up and so forth. The incense represents uh, Jesus, uh, his righteousness accompanying my prayers. That's what the meaning of the incense. And, and only the high priest could go in here and put incense on there and burn it. And then there was, here, here's the thing. You remember chapter 1, the first night we were together, uh, uh, John says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and I saw what? Seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with this golden girdle. So uh, that scene in Revelation 1, he's actually seeing it inside the heavenly sanctuary called Tabernacle in in verse in chapter 13 and called what here in chapter 11 temple all right and so here was on this side of the room was the seven branched candlestick and all these things actually actually represent Jesus and over here was a table with bread on it what did Jesus say to the Jewish people 
in John chapter 6. You wouldn't know maybe. He says, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no place with me. It was a metaphor, wasn't it, folks? But uh, that's enough for now. I want you to be thinking about this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the clarity of truth and how it protects us from being deceived. Bless my dear friends here this evening, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.